This is an autobiographical account of why I came to Earth, and it forms my great saga on purpose by David Kahn. It was many, many years ago that I set a foot upon this fledgling planet for the first time, and I kept hearing from the outset that it would not be easy, though I could not resist the excitement of such a voyage. I was hooked by the romanticized sense of adventure where the thrill of spiritual development on a planet like Earth sounded gritty and dense, even before gritty and dense were cool. The decision to come to Earth was triggered by what is akin to a co-op work placement in my third year of university back on Sirius A. That's about the closest reference we have in Earth terms. The Syrian Agenda for Earth was a large, well-funded program hatched by one of my favorite professors, Professor Ketsukoto, or Professor Q. It had the true air of elegance and simplicity, entwined with a healthy dose of patience. Given my affinity for the program's approach and my bias towards this particular professor, I was in. Up until this point, I was pretty naive to the breadth and variety of existence. Having had most of my formatory incarnations on Sirius A, there had not been much adversity or struggle. The Syrians were a civilization that had already evolved to a certain level of balance and unity, hence why it was so well positioned to help other civilizations evolve. But honestly, it was boring. It lacked strife, conflict, and all the juicy, edgy circumstances that lead to rapid soul development. I had been told by Professor Q that rolling up my sleeves and getting down and dirty with an emerging civilization was a really effective way to mature spiritually and do it fast. Not to mention, satisfy the 12 credit course requirement and look great on my university transcript. Some lessons cannot be learned through mere theory. They must be experienced. My energetic signature was well disposed to doing things fast with high risks and excessive amounts of dramatic excitement. Our school had the highest caliber of the sixth generation incarnation simulator. The first five generations all had bugs in which the power would intermittently go out and leave the poor users in a perpetual rebirth loop. Not fun. Generally, they'd have to call tech support and they would always show up way too late once the poor soul has been spun round and round through so many bardos. Fortunately, word on the street was that they had fixed all the bugs with this model. Other upgrades were made including features such as full-blown amnesia upon initiation and the induction of complete tactile hallucinations so powerful that you would begin to think you had always incarnated in the simulation script. On that fateful day that I stepped towards the sixth generation incarnation simulator, I felt a deep sense of trepidation. I knew that my contribution to the co-op program would take many lifetimes of hard effort, and the planet was still quite dense, so there was a real risk that I could be swept away entrained in the dreams of the simulation for what seemed like far longer than anyone had initially planned. But my rebellious side kicked in and chirped, why not? It'll be an adventure and a great story to tell once you come back. And that was enough to overcome my sudden hesitation. It was also the last thing that I remembered. There was this world of a multi-dimensional wormhole filled with a myriad of hypercolor and gravitational forces so strong they made time travel feel like a walk in the park. Eventually, all went black. It was completely silent for what seemed like ever. The next thing I knew, I was a small child in a sector of Earth with extremely red soil and a beautiful night sky. I lived with a tribe of 300 people who were simple, nomadic, and highly effective shamans. These shamans were highly capable voyagers from a culture that had existed for roughly 20,000 years before I had arrived. Their knowledge of the stars was extremely impressive, and they were well convinced that I had come from a very small but bright star far away that they had well mapped in their cosmological and astrological lore. These shamans were cool. 
made her to serious. I truly love my time with these people. What they had lacked in the technical sophistication that I was accustomed to in Sirius A, they made up for with savvy excursions into Dreamtime. My excursions into Dreamtime allowed me to slowly begin bridging the gap between who I thought I was and who I truly was. After a few lifetimes, I was highly skilled at bridging the amnesia gap and remembered who I truly was, a third-year university student from Sirius A at the outset of his co-op work term. It must have been 20 to 30 lifetimes well spent amongst these people, and that part of my development will always be associated with fond memories in my solar ego memory bank. But like all great experiences, even this one was transitory in the great unfolding of the third-year co-op term. Eventually, there came another group from across the seas. They were highly advanced technologically and could use their consciousness to manipulate large transport devices through a crystalline array. It seemed oddly familiar. When they arrived, I immediately recognized the sigil emblazoned on their boats. It was a Syrian emblem, and immediately I had clued in that my research team had used this emblem to let me know where I was to head next. At the end of that lifetime, I focused intensely on remembering the exact details of that sigil, the Syrian emblem, and at the time of transit, I used the sigil to influence a rebirth into that civilization, and it worked very well. I reincarnated into the great civilization of Atlantis, Several of my classmates were directly involved with me in Atlantis, and we were very quick in relearning the ropes to help the ongoing effort of grounding the Syrian teachings into the fabric of that civilization. The Atlanteans really took to our offerings, implementing most of the teachings within a period of a mere 200 years. It all seemed far too easy. It truly felt like it had been quite breezy and this co-op term would end fairly soon. The Atlanteans were evolving technologically, in lockstep with their spiritual development, and they were nearly ready to cross the threshold between a Type 0 civilization and a Type 1 civilization, which is the minimum requirement for admission into the LAGC, which is the League of Advanced Galactic Civilizations, for anyone who might not know. The grim warnings I had faint recollections of seemed to be completely, overly cautious and meaningless at this point. They struck me as the conservative ramblings of an old professor who had seen a lot of things go wrong in his day and was acting like a fear-mongering worrywart. Clearly, he had misjudged this posting. Little did I know, I could not have been more wrong and the next turn of events was going to expose my hubris rather abruptly. After several lifetimes in Atlantis, I became aware of a dark undercurrent of something truly off that was stirring. Well, disruptive would have been a better word than dark, because I can kind of see it from the other perspective too. It turns out that another research team from the Draconian sector was also stationed in Atlantis. Their work was a hell of a lot more controversial than what we were doing. You see, our mission was simply to ground the Syrian doctrine on this planet so that it would gracefully evolve according to universal law, and then Earth could join the league of other advanced civilizations in the western rim of the Milky Way galaxy. It really seemed like that work would be over after Atlantis had ripened and we would be able to return home soon to tell the tales of a job well done. Maybe even have a bit of time to go on some end of summer excursions before the start of fourth year. Clearly, that wasn't going to happen now. The Draconians were involved in some rather gruesome genetic modification and soul harvesting research that evaded the watchful eye of the Galactic Regulatory Board. You see, they were trying to get things done without any of the usual red tape. But in this case, red tape meant that procedures were strictly followed in accordance with galactic law. And the Draconians had no regard for galactic law as it impeded their ability to do their studies their way. Every time that our team successfully implemented a new system for unlocking higher consciousness, the Draconians would come along and usurp it. 
they would work themselves into the command hierarchy of that particular system and take all that they could before twisting and manipulating the system to serve their machoistic agenda. It was fucking frustrating. By about 14,000 years before Mr. Yeshua, or JC as some of you know him, showed up, the Draconians had successfully and fully hijacked all of our work. We had sent a number of requests back to Professor Q and the team on Sirius A asking for additional support, and they kept responding that the astrology wasn't currently suited for any further intervention. God damn academics and their reliance on astrology. I wanted to get home quick and tell my paramour about all the great work I had done on Earth while camping with her in the lush jungles of the Lyran sector. Clearly, patience was not my strong suit. A group of us began an initiative where we disseminated information to all the corners of Earth not currently influenced by Atlantis and hence by the Draconian plot. The objective was to share the Syrian knowledge with the less technologically advanced cultures of this planet. Atlantis was effectively a lost cause at this point, as the Draconians had meddled their way so far into politics that we had no hope of effecting change there. Not to mention the insane manipulations of the global Atlantean energy grid that they were willing to risk in order to uphold their dominance. We could also see the writing on the wall. The draconian research had grown so oppressive that it had resulted in numerous uprisings from various factions of Atlantean life, namely the Athenian faction. The draconians hated dissent and were ready to stomp it out with an excessively heavy hand. If they had their way and weaponized the mega satellite crystal against dissenting factors, they could easily risk blowing the entire planet to smithereens. Things got stressful fast, and we had to keep cool and execute our plan B. And despite the dire and perilous circumstance, we were successful in initiating it. Funny how strong group intention has a way of shifting the dynamics of even extremely fucking rough situations rather smoothly. We found a particularly strong resonance with some human groups in the Nile region, and were able to train them quickly on how to build large structures where high knowledge could be stored for at least tens of thousands of years. The Nile culture would get some beautiful cushy temple space, and we would get to advance the Syrian agenda, so it was a win-win scenario. We began working with the Nile culture, and were very impressed at their skill and versatility. They were fast learners and did an excellent job of recreating Syrian Atlantean technology in the short span of only 2,000 years. Of course, there were complications. Inevitably, the Draconians initiated that catastrophe I'd mentioned before and messed things up royally. Fortunately for everyone, global annihilation didn't fully happen. The structures we built did stand. Some people did survive. Apparently, around this time, there was a lifeboat initiative executed by the LAGC, but we were too busy putting out local fires to notice. In any case, a bit of higher assistance is always welcome when co-op projects don't go to plan and the professor stopped golfing for long enough to do something of actual value. This help was well needed. However, it didn't change the reality we were faced with. The draconian catastrophe changed the face of the planet and set the humans way back in their developmental sequence. It was obvious we would have to start all over again at ground zero. Fortunately, we had a couple pyramids and a sphinx to accelerate the learning process. Additionally, some of Professor Q's B team had been grounding the Jeweled Lotus Initiative, and we called it Julie for short, in the Himalayas. Apparently, that effort had been very successful in reseeding the Trans-Himalayan and Indus Valley regions quite effectively. The Himalayan and Indus Valley cultures had maintained a spiritual uptake ratio of 0.92, which was even slightly higher than my Nile compatriots. However, during this time, 
our work was very slow and dull. 6,000 years went by, and trust me, they were the longest 6,000 years you could imagine. We basically had to re-educate the humans from a Stone Age consciousness into a moderately effective level of Bronze Age ritual and agrarian functioning. After the splendor of working with the Atlanteans, it felt like pulling teeth, educating humans on moral basics like, no, 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 not eye for eye, no tooth for tooth. And if Zag steals your club, just let it be. Don't steal his saber-toothed tiger meat in retaliation. We eventually got the Nile region happening, and they flourished into the glorious mystery schools of the Comitian era. These schools were masterful in their execution, and we owe it in no small part to the brilliance of the Nile crew. They had developed a 40-year curriculum where self-knowledge was taught alongside the mighty quadrivium of astronomy, mathematics, geometry, and music, and were churning out some of the best minds that the ancient world had seen. Heck, even Pythagoras graduated from Kemet. Unfortunately, the Draconians showed up again like red ants at a picnic. Damn reptiles. We were helpless to watch as they once again wriggled their way into temple hierarchy and perverted the whole system with crude forms of lower dimensional sex magic and blood sacrifice. When that wasn't enough, they sponsored the dominators in slogans like Might is right and prevail for bail became commonplace in Bronze Age Mesopotamia. I became pretty depressed at this point in my co-op term. I drowned my sorrows on heady philosophy and wine in ancient Greece for a while, until the Romans showed up and ruined that form of escapism. Of course, guess who was helping the Romans? Yep, reptiles. I wasn't done feeling sorry for myself at this point. So I fled east to chill with my Byzantine and Sufi colleagues for a couple hundred years. Sometimes you need to step away from your project to get a fresh perspective, and I was sure to notice a unique opportunity during this brief respite. A unique opportunity in human history, you could say. Once again, we were in the midst of upheaval by the Draconians. The Catholic Church began stepping on our turf by sending their muscle, the Knights Templar, to conquer the Middle East. But they had made a grave mistake by trying to breed a warrior class with too much mysticism, as these heavies turned out to be quite susceptible to higher spiritual principles. As the Crusaders advanced, we began dangling esoteric carrots and leaving occult breadcrumbs that the spiritually trained would notice, and the barbarians they'd obviously ignore. It worked. The Templar became very interested in Sufi lore and came to meet with us on many occasions. My colleagues and I continued dialoguing with the Templar for a couple decades, educating them on the inherent gaps left behind by a patriarchal church on the intricacies of universal law. And boy, did that work. In fact, it worked so well that they eventually gave up on their crusades after only a couple centuries. We had heard rumors from some of the wandering Kabbalistic magicians that secret societies were forming in medieval Europe and were powerful enough to overthrow even the kings of that great continent. Me and my co-op mates became exuberant with the news. Had we just found a way to relinquish the grasp of draconian dominance? I was renewed with a sense of optimism and decided to take a few incarnations in bon bonny old England to see how things had been transpiring on the far left of the Eurasian continent. In my first incarnation, I grew up to be a diviner to the lords, an alchemist that discovered a rather interesting chemical compound growing upon the mold of rye bread. I had seen several peasants eat moldy rye bread, scream in agony as the veil of the higher dimensions was uranically fractured open upon their unsuspecting consciousness before dying due to a painful form of cardiac duress. Immediately, I took interest in this compound. What could have caused the veil to recede so strongly? Upon examining it, I found there was a fatal compound, which I removed, and I extracted the beneficial psychotropic molecules to create a beautiful ambrosia that allowed one to connect directly with the higher dimensions. Here, I thought I was just creating some naughty soma for an old alchemist to enjoy. Little did I know, 
a Swiss chemist would rediscover this compound for the amusement of some Neo-Atlanteans several hundred years later. In a summer of love. This alchemical extraction became a true boon for my divination business, and I became the hottest astrologer in York in a matter of months. I grew influential enough to connect with a few Templar lodges, and rich enough to afford my own tower where I could be left alone. Alone, until that one fateful day, I was out for a stroll and found a little black cat mewing from the hole. This little black cat was actually an incarnation of my third year paramour who had come to visit me on my co-op term. Not sure if this was a violation of university protocol, but at this point in the game, I no longer cared. I scooped the cat into my cloak and took her back to my tower. We spent the rest of the lifetime in the tower staring into eternity and enjoying that heavily extract. She was a lot more in tune than I was. When I asked her when the humans would finally be ripened to evolve, she was able to predict an exact future coordinate about 800 years from the date where the unification of the polarities would finally coalesce into a harmonious golden era of spiritual prosperity, the union of the divine masculine with the divine feminine. This lifetime that I was living was a well-needed respite. It was full of many fond moments where my paramour and I could nurture our relationship, albeit in the strange, non-sexually provocative form of an elderly alchemist and a multidimensional cat. I felt powerful and like I could put the hard work aside for a couple well-earned decades of languishing in that power. The only downside was that there was no physical intercourse, astral sex only. Though it was fun and insightful for me to live as this alchemist, it did not truly help to advance the Syrian plan any further. My work ethic kicked in, and I decided it was time to get back to business. I decided rather hastily to take my next incarnation as a Templar and try a forceful approach to the rapid advancement of consciousness amongst the human populace. I reincarnated again in Northern England as a powerful and influential Templar. This was after Friday the 13th, 1307, when the Templar were on the run after King Philip of France got jealous of their power, wealth, and influence. He spread rumors that they were devil worshippers, and in the Christian era, being a devil worshipper was the equivalent of being labeled a far-right conspiracy theorist of the postmodern era. So, we were highly trained mystical warriors on the run. All we needed was a kingdom that would allow us to thrive and disseminate our esoteric lore. Fortunately, we learned of an ongoing undercover plan to initiate Celtic sovereignty in Scotland. Without further ado, I guided my Templar brethren to assist Robert the Bruce in attaining Scottish independence. The British Isles in those days were under the rule of Team Draconian with their king, Edward Longshanks. Eddie, as we called him, was attempting to thwart the effort for Scottish independence by marching on Bannockburn. And oh, ho oh, oh, ho oh, ho, was that a funny battle! 25,000 ultra-serious English soldiers lined up against 13,000 Scottish Irregulars. Right as the English charged forward, a hundred knights Templar pincered them from an oblique angle. With the way the sun was shining that day, it gleamed off of our armor and made it look like we had angel wings on our back. Eddie's forces immediately bolted, screaming about religious superstition, and the battle was over with hardly an arrow fired. It was a job well done. After we achieved independence, I let things get to my head. We had effectively forged an independent empire where the Templar were allowed to investigate and develop esoteric lore to disseminate it amongst the people. Unfortunately, I took it upon myself to continue the forceful approach and force higher consciousness upon further reaches of the populace through military conquest. I had lost that essential sense of humor, allowed things to get serious, and it did not end well. I watched my well-intentioned but completely misguided approach blow up right in my face. I was no better than the Draconians in being a dominating asshole, and now it was time for me to face this dark part of my psyche. I wandered aimlessly in a 
days for the next 800 years. That is how long it took me to shake the specters of what I had done before I could get back on board with the program. It was also how long it took for me to get over my nostalgic attachment to that time I had spent with my paramour and a fuckload of that divine moldy ambrosia in the tower. Naturally, when I came to and was ready to get with the program again, it happened to co coincide with an exact pivotal moment in Earth's evolution. It was right around that astro astrological event that Professor Q had mentioned and my paramour had intuited. Saturn and Pluto had just finished a conjunction, and some unsuspecting kid was born in a remote town in Canada. This lifetime is the one in which I currently lived. Standing at the cusp of either a great spiritual revolution or another devolution into madness and destruction, only this time the stakes are much higher. The dominant societal technology was far dirtier than the Atlanteans, which was causing far greater planetary environmental impact. Not to mention, the global population had skyrocketed and humans were everywhere! Fortunately, a good portion of the population was ripe for spiritual development. Slowly, since old Atlantis, the Lemurian factions of Earth population had been steadily evolving. Many of those had done great spiritual penance over the ages and had passed the threshold of the first initiation into enlightenment. Additionally, there were a ton of other star souls stationed on Earth at this point that had already passed the second initiation. Thank God for the evolved star souls incarnated at this time. The galactic intervention had finally happened, and for once I felt a great excitement and optimism that we can all make the shift take place in Earth. Professor Q was on board, the Galactic Council was on board, and the Draconians seemed like they were growing tired of pulling everything up and might actually be ready to finally move on. Well, move on after one final show of force. We still don't know how this show of force will go down, and many of us don't quite fully grok their endgame strategy. Like at the end of Atlantis, we are strategizing that the best play is to leave the party before the music goes to excruciating levels, before the older kids from the other side of town show up, and the furniture gets trashed, and the cops throw everyone in the drunk tank. In other words, our plan is to exit the draconian-controlled society and form new seedling communities where higher consciousness and wisdom can incubate for a few generations. Communities that will eventually reemerge and reintegrate spiritual wisdom in the aftermath of the endgame scenario. We don't know exactly how things will play out, but we need to create a buffer of sanctuary so that higher knowledge has a chance of surviving in the face of this impending insanity. It's all high stakes at this point, and my heart flutters even typing this, especially because I'm impatient and don't like surprise endings. But hell, I still have a penchant for high-risk, high-stakes scenarios chock full of excitement, so I am so down to participate with my role in this uber crazy mission. Sometimes the best plot lines have a fuckload of problem, and you need to be white knuckled at the edge of your seat before the happy ending begins. My faith is in the great Syrian agenda for this world, and I trust Professor Q and the rest of the Galactic Council with their vision for the divine evolution of this time planet. Namaste.